Yeah, okay. So I will turn off my sound now and Martin, you can start. So, hello all and welcome to this session. From the Young Minds Project of European Physical Society. Hello, Herbsen. Hi. Second, uh, I have with me here uh, Stephen Goldfarb from uh, the International Particle Physics Outreach Group. Hello. Hello and welcome. And last but not least, Terence Rooney from Optical Society of America. Hello, Terence. Hey, everyone. So th thanks, thank you all for coming. And I would also like to thank uh, Duarte Garza for making all this possible. So uh, let's jump right in. Um, now I will read you the bio of Herbsen and then I will give her uh, some space to, uh, to tell her, uh, tell, uh, um, to present her. Uh, thank her, you. So her bio. Uh, Ripsin is a researcher at uh, a, a, a Aklinian National Science Laboratory of Yerevan Physics Institute. With her PhD in September, Ripsin's research topic is devoted to investigating of the thundercloud electrification processes and thunderstorm ground enhancements. And she is also interested, interested in the global electric circuit and electric field measurements. In 2018, Herbstein founded the Yerevan Young Mind section, which is brand, a uh, branch of one of European physical society projects. Uh, the main idea is to create an environment for interconnecting young, young researchers and to promote science uh, to the broad public. At the beginning of 2020, Herbstein was selected as one of the action committee members of EFC Young Minds project. And besides this, uh, she loves to take photos of lightnings and clouds and everything related to the sky is make it, making her be in the full swing. So Herbstein, uh, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And I am so happy to, to have opportunity to uh, speak about Young Man's project. And now I am going to have a little presentation and I will be happy to get, have any kind of questions. So just sharing the screen. Okay, so do I need the permission for that? Uh, Martin, can I ask for permission? Mm, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Needs to be working now. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so uh, today uh, I'm going to speak about uh, European Physical Society Young Minds Project. So at first, let me to introduce what European Physical Society is. Uh, it is Federation of National Societies, or then more than four, 42 member societies, and it uh, was founded in 1968 in Geneva. It um, includes more than uh, 3,500 individual members and representing more than uh, 100,000 European physicists. So um, in uh, 2010, uh, it was, uh, there was a um, uh, like gathering of the sci uh, my members of the EPS and they are decided to create a platform for students and early career researchers in physics uh, in order to create a, an opportunity for them to recruit future researchers in physics and promote physics amongst youngs and also connect the young scientists in Europe. So uh, the Young Mind uh, project is uh, excellent uh, chance for creating infrastructure for young physicists to emerge and get involved. And uh, also it supports uh, for self-organized, uh, to self-organize the section in the countries and uh, interaction between the sections. Um, 
So who can join to the Young Minds section? Uh, every undergraduate student, PhD student, and postdoc students. And uh, also they should have a European Physical Society or National Physical uh, Society membership. They have to have a, any um, like advisor to give them advice how to, to establish the section, how to promote the science and so on. Uh, so if they will, dis if someone will decide to have a section in their country, they should uh, uh, have uh, at least four members. Uh, they will define, they have to define the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer, and then uh, choose a local senior scientist as an advisor. And then uh, they need to write a bylaw uh, and decide the name of the section, which will represent the only, not only the country, but also the uh, city or university where they are uh, based, and then apply in our website. So the link is below and you can just uh, easily go there and see all instruction there. So after that, they, we will discuss and approve the section. So now we have, actually this was the old uh, number, but we have around 61 sections, uh, around 30 countries. And they all, um, it was like along uh, the 10 years which happened. And so uh, I wanted to mention that this year we have anniversary of uh, Young Mind Section uh, project. And so they are from a um, lot of countries and uh, it's very nice to meet all of uh, all the different peoples to investigate their culture and what they are doing for the physics. And uh, it's giving lots of benefits to the uh, members of the projects as they can apply for activity grant and um, participate uh, in conferences getting, uh, which is organized by EPS, getting award for that. Also uh, annually we have a leadership meeting when they can come represent their section and learn new things uh, from the uh, other sections. Uh, actually, uh, each section uh, is doing a lot of activities uh, during the year and every year, the, uh, year they can apply for best activity award and uh, they will grant it from the EPL and also from EPS. Also, uh, EPS is giving opportunity for the Young Minds pro uh, Project uh, members, uh, so sections, they can organize uh, conferences in their countries and they get funded for that. Uh, so let's uh, go with uh, more details on this. Uh, so uh, what is the activity grant? So they, uh, every section uh, during the year, they are doing lots of activities, uh, outreach activities, networking, or um, developing their academic skills. So for that, for doing some kind of things, they need to apply for the activity grant. And uh, it's uh, up to 1,000 euro per year. Uh, uh, we had uh, two deadlines. So if the section is not ready for the January 15, they can apply for July. And um, after that, we are investigating uh, their um, like applications and uh, deciding to award or no. So there is some kind of restriction for this, uh, but in any case, uh, it's uh, nice that every time we are getting lots of nice ideas they want to implement in their countries. Uh, actually, there is also opportunity, as I mentioned, for the young men sections to uh, organize a conference uh, for what we are going, uh, we uh, we are ready to uh, grant them uh, up to one thousand euro, and uh, for that there is a deadlines for deadlines there, and they need to make a reports about that. Uh, but it's very nice for opportunity uh, for the sections to join also for the another uh, like physical societies uh, and uh, to make a joint work and organize very cool conferences together. Um, as I mentioned, uh, once per year, we are having leadership meeting where they, we are inviting one uh, representative from each uh, section and they are coming to represent not only their uh, section activities, but what they have done and uh, what they are going to do and also about uh, represent their culture things. 
And uh, as I mentioned, they have opportunity during the leadership meeting won a prize uh, from EPL uh, or uh, from the um, EPS. Uh, so about the leadership meeting, so we had organized it uh, 11 years and there was a, a, this year should be the anniversary of the uh, European Physical Society Young Minds Project, but uh, there was, um, as we have a COVID time, we have to postpone it till next year. So the activities that happened in 2019 and 2020 will be presented next year, and we will announce where it was going to be, uh, when it is going to be, and um, we, all, uh, we will share all the things which will happen that time. So um, it's um, actually it's a great opportunity for the students uh, to uh, during the leadership meeting to meet a new culture, learn to socialize, improve their English, uh, also develop your uh, develop their skills, learn self management, have wider perspectives on the future possibilities, and also. Um, it is a good uh, opportunity to, to them to find new friends and why not to establish the collaboration as well on the scientific basis. So we are, we are encouraging uh, to all of uh, students to share this and be part and uh, to promote the science together. If you want to uh, be you know, if you want to be part of the project, you can visit our web page and you will find uh, all instruction which I have represented here. You can also follow us on Facebook and there is a group in LinkedIn and to a Twitter page, uh, which is not that active, but we are keep, uh, trying to keep it active. Uh, so if I had a little time, I can just uh, speak about little bit activities which we are doing uh, in year one as well. Yes, you have oh. some time. Please. Yes, so I will. Um, as I mentioned, I have uh, I have founded uh, Yerevan Young Minds uh, in 2018. So here uh, is our activities uh, during the um, 2019. And uh, what the um, idea is that so we are getting um, we have established. Uh, uh, section in Armenia and after that we started to have an activity to um, to develop our uh, scientific um, like overview and to see what we can do in in our countries uh, using connection networking outreach so we have uh, organized lab tours uh, organized scientific conferences uh, organize uh, industrial meetings like where we can use our knowledge uh, from the Physics, physics, and we have done lots of lots of uh, outreach activities. We have just uh, gathered uh, small groups and went to the villages and uh, started to present uh, about the physics, about the wonders of the science to the school kids. They were wondering, they were acting, they they want to try with their hands. And we had uh, actually the experience when we have shown the uh, like uh, experience during the activity. These kids went to home and started to uh, started to do the same. And his mother take this photo to and send us and saying thank you for this. So we had also an, um, when we have one activity in our, our Artsakh region, uh, there was. Um, there was a participant uh, from the, there was a, like a, a girl who came to uh, uh, like interviewing us and she decided to try herself. So it's uh, making uh, public to be engaged in the activities. We have went a lot of uh, like cities and we have part uh, making uh, the environmental issues as uh, trying to solve environmental issues. And also uh, we tried to uh, find a way how to connect science uh, with society. So this is uh, Gayane. Uh, she has um, like invented, she, she has uh, made the device which can uh, used for the plastic uh, to reduce the plastic waste and uh, she used her uh, skills of the science. Uh, and uh, 
uh, we had one project as well. We tried to connect school and university together. And uh, during the, this uh, project, uh, as we had very old staff in university after Soviet time, uh, so the students doesn't have uh, too much practice on this. So we decided to create the them platform to have try something. So the schools are not uh, in a good situation. And so they do not have a labs and uh, classrooms are or even do not have any special uh, things for the scientific exp experiments. Uh, so for the idea, we have applied for the awesome foundation and we got uh, awarded for that. And after that, we started to build the so students after their classes, they came and started to build the devices. And after that, we um, uh, like they have learned a lot from there, which they cannot learn in university. It was informal education for them. And after that, we, we make uh, handmade boxes and send it, um, them to the villages. And the uh, kids were happy because they can play. We can they can do something which they are not learning from the books. They and they are interested in the science in this way. So we have presented it. This is in a lot of meetings and uh, organizations. And uh, yes, so you can also follow us on um, Facebook, Yerevan Young Mind section. And we are now working in several other projects. Um, we, are tr we are trying now to build whispering dishes, uh, which will be the uh, very first monument, scientific monument in one of the regions in Armenia. And also we are trying to establish online scientific cafe for the students. And we, are, we will be very happy to um, represent any activities for all interested parties and also about whole uh, um, uh, sections of uh, European Physical Society. You can find a lot of things in uh, our page. Uh, so you can uh, visit um, our Facebook page and find a lot of things there as well. We are trying to in, uh, encourage our sections and then we are posting about them in our page. So we will be happy to have a new section there and to represent and tell about our uh, activities. Thank you. So thank you Hepsi, for our presentation. And now we will move on to the second speaker, which is Steven. Uh, I, okay, again, I will read you Steven's bio and then I will give him some time for his presentation. So Steven is a particle physics physicist from the University of Melbourne working on the Atlas experiment at CERN. He has served as the MUON software software coordinator, outreach coordinator and contributed to the, to the early studies in the search for the Higgs boson. Steve currently chairs the International Particle Physics Outreach Group, or IPOC, uh, coordinates University of Michigan undergraduate, undergraduate programs at CERN, uh, serves, as, uh, serves on the Quarkanet advisor, Advisory Board, and is an American Physics Society Fellow, uh, serving on the Committee for Informing the Public. Uh, Stephen frequently, frequently gives public talks on science, uh, discover and international co collaboration. He co-wrote a popular TED video, The Basics of the Higgs Boson, and most importantly, he fronts the world famous Kenneth Blues Band. So this is Stephen's bow, and now uh, Stephen, it's your turn. So thank you, Martin. And, and thank you, Ripsy, for that very nice uh, presentation. It's very interesting, I didn't, I didn't know about young minds before. Now I know a little Thank more. My, my old mind has learned something new. Um, let me see if I can share my presentation. Looks like I'll be able to do that. Well, it's great how we've all become Zoom experts uh, in the past few months. <laughs> uh, let's see. Are you seeing this OK? Yep, I got a thumbs up from Terrence. Okay, so I made it over the ocean, so I should make it to everybody else. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a bit about um, IPOG, the International Particle Physics Outreach Group. Uh, it's uh, really um, an international collaboration now. We formalized several years ago, uh, but uh, 
most importantly, we, we work with students and that's what's fun, students and teachers. Um, just, just to remind you uh, about, I was told to speak about outreach. Uh, and I just wanna remind you why. Um, this is a, a group of people you've probably seen before. Uh, they're the public. Uh, many of us who went into science you know, might have done it to avoid them, but turns out they're all right. The public's not bad. Uh, they give us our funding for our research and they're interested in what we do. Um, they don't uh, look like that anymore. They actually look more like this now, of course, uh, but you know, times, times change. Still, they're interested in, in what we're doing in our research. Um, the public uh, works hard. They do a lot. And um, they have to ask themselves at the end of the day when they put in a full day of work or, or even more than what we're used to, um, why? Uh, why should they give a part of their money uh, to support what we're doing? Uh, you know, I, I do particle physics. Why, why would you support something which is so esoterical as trying to figure out fundamental components of nature? Um, this is another um, body of uh, animals, uh, slightly lower in intelligence. So we call them uh, <laughs> politicians. Um, they, uh, they are also very important people. I shouldn't put them down. They're very bright people, very important. Uh, and they have a lot of important decisions that they have to make, I'm mainly dealing uh, with our resources that we have to share on this planet. And so if we're, if we're lucky, the questions that they're asking themselves is, is not why, but it's more how much, you know, how much of the precious resources they need to keep their countries running uh, should they devote to fundamental research. Finally, here's the most intelligent form of creature uh, on the planet, and that's students. That's you guys. Um, they have a lot of questions too. Uh, they, I don't know if you remember this, we used to actually get together in groups, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, we weren't just on Zoom, we were actually physically in contact. Um, so uh, they, they have a lot of important questions too. And their main questions uh, are these two, you know, who, who do they believe? Because they have a lot of information coming at them these days. And um, what, what to do? You know, what, what do you want to do with your career? Um, they see a lot of answers these days uh, coming from a variety of different sources. Um, and a lot of them aren't good. Uh, there are things out there people trying to say the earth is round, we shouldn't take vaccines. There's even a journal, scientific journal on homeopathy. Um, there are these politician people who don't believe that global warming exists. Um, there's uh, people who should know better, uh, who, who are supposed to be in charge of classrooms, um, who don't care about the health of our students. And well, there are morons everywhere. Um, and as a result, they get a lot of bad, bad information. If you do this, this is a terrible thing to do, but <laughs> I do it on occasion. I log out of YouTube. I log out of YouTube and then I go search for something like CERN because I'm a student and I wanna find out what really is CERN about? Well, <laughs> you'll find out that, that right now, seven of the 10 items is garbage, conspiracy theory. Uh, you know, there's a lot of information out there that's true about CERN, but it gets overwhelming. There's a lot of garbage out there, let me call it. Fortunately, we had Katie up there, who's still number one, who did the Large Hadron Wrap, and that's still the most popular video. But you can see there's a lot of stuff out there uh, that's confusing. It might confuse people. And yet, in this sort of backdrop, in that environment, we have some really big plans in our field. We're making huge steps in the past few decades we've made enormous steps forward and as a result we're excited and we want to do bigger things huge things um if we think that the large hadron collider is large it's going to look small if you look at the middle upper picture there it's going to look small compared to the the circle that we want to build uh, which would be a hundred kilometer round uh accelerator uh, but that's what we need to do. You have to go to higher energies to look at smaller wavelengths. You guys are physics students, you know that, E equals H nu. Uh, and to do that, you need uh, to have a very large track and you have to have very large detectors uh, to be able to probe to very small dimensions, higher energies, smaller dimensions. 
there's a lot of great ideas out there. We've spent the past three years actually coming up with a plan on how to go forward with this. Um, so now we have to go to the public and say, hey guys, you know, in spite of what you see on YouTube, we need your resources. Um, and the time scales on these things are enormous. 70 years is our planning to build accelerators to do the stuff that we want to do. Uh, it's not short term. That means that if you look at what the public will see is what the media report and the media report on the biggest price tag they can find. Okay, so over 70 years, it will have a large price tag. Uh, and so there are a lot of questions out there. Is this, is this worthwhile? So how do we prepare for this? How do we explain to the public that it's extremely important to do this research? Well, that's where education, outreach, and communication uh, come into play. Uh, something that I've had the fortune to be involved in for a few decades now. Um, and that's, you know, either communication is reporting our results. Of course, we have an obligation to do that. If you find something out, we've been receiving public funding, we should tell the world what we found. And anyway, that's why we're doing it. Science isn't science unless you share what we've found. Uh, but education and outreach to me are a little bit deeper, even more important because when we do education outreach, we go into classrooms and we try to establish some understanding, not just of the science, but of the, of the process. What is it we're doing? How is it we know what we're doing makes sense? And how is that going to advance us? We try to instill an appreciation for fundamental research and we wanna build trust. You'll learn this more and more. If you, learn about, if you wanna learn about how to do effective outreach, how to do effective communication, building trust is essential. Um, and our goal, of course, one of our goals is not just to build that trust, but is to train some new physicists. We need new physicists to do the work that we're set out ahead. Um, and we view ourselves not just as something that you do, oh, you do the research and then you do some outreach. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, we're strategic pillars. You do the outreach first, you get the community on board, explain what you're trying to find, and then you can do the research because they will support you. They will elect officials will support this. Okay. Um, IPOG is, is uh, a group that I've had the pleasure to be involved in for, for some time now. Um, we're an international scientific collaboration. Now we have researchers uh, who are active in research uh, as well as, pe and then they have some experience doing education outreach. And we also have experts uh, who are involved in this in communication education. We're a network now of 33 members. It's going to increase their, their members per country. It started with just the countries that were the members of CERN, uh, but we expanded beyond Europe. Australia is a member, uh, uh, the, the US, um, there's, uh, we're, we're expanding outward. Um, we have uh, 26 countries, six experiments, international lab. We also have, it's called associate membership. We have a national laboratory and that's going to be expanding as well. Um, we have a body that votes and makes decisions about what to do with resources. Uh, we uh, organize global activities, the main activities. If you've heard of us, you've heard about international particle physics master classes and also about global cosmics, worldwide day to day and global cosmics. These are two ways that we reach around the globe, major projects and things that you could get involved in. Uh, we also support local activities. We provide some resources for, for various activities going on uh, around the globe. Uh, this is our foundings. I don't want to spend a lot of time in this. This gentleman here, uh, Chris Llewellyn Smith, was our director general. Uh, it was his idea that we needed uh, to be founded. And you can see EPS actually played uh, a role in this and still plays a, a role. Uh, we, we no longer report to EPS, we report primarily to CERN, but um, uh, they, they have always played a role and we've, we've partnered with them. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to go into more in that. Um, our primary goal is just sort of sustainable development of particle physics outreach. So it means that we have a forum, we meet a couple times a year and we discuss what's going on, how we're going to improve our activities. Um, we have working groups who work in specific areas. Um, we uh, we're also, you know, want to establish standards worldwide, make sure that, that uh, we learn how to evaluate what we're doing and how to make better material. If there's something coming up, for example, we'll try to prepare explanatory material about that. Um, and we're extending our reach all the time. I'll show you that. You see a picture here. This is just uh, our membership, which is, as I mentioned, is growing. 
um, the countries in green will all be members very, very soon. Um, and so, uh, so that will bring us up to, I don't know, 37 or something like that. Uh, we're going we're gonna to cov cover the whole globe with blue, but I think there's other more important things. Um, uh, we have commitments, uh, and I don't want to go into detail here, but it's essentially, you know, if you're a country, it's rather important because your country, if it signs up to be a member of IPOG, then they're agreeing that they recognize the importance of education and outreach. Okay, and that can be very valuable. It means they're committing resources. And so they're going to support people who do outreach. And it's not minor. It's hard to explain how important that is, but that they've actually signed something. The amount of money is very small for a country, but that commitment is very important. Uh, we recognize that outreach, you know, you do, if you do a physics experiment, you need to do hardware, you need to do readout, you need to do electronics, you need to do software, right? But you also need to do outreach. So it's, it's, it's on par there. It's considered to be a part of it. Um, our organization is simple. Uh, there's a, two of us who are elected as chairs. We get elected to three-year terms. I'm in my start of my second term this year. Um, uh, Pedro just joined us, uh, but he's been an IPOC member for a long, long time. He's from Lisbon. Um, we have a core team of a couple people, half of a couple people, small core team, but they work very, very hard, uh, helping us with communication, helping us uh, actually to, to, to run uh, the program. And our main projects, I mentioned the master classes, uh, we have two people, actually half of two people, we get halves of people, uh, Uta and Ken, uh, who helped organize master classes, and Sabine and Caro are, are organizing our global cosmics. Um, and uh, we have a variety of organizational bodies, which is basically to handle finances and stuff like this. I'm not going to go into any details with that. Um, we get together, you can see images from us, our meetings up above when we used to meet in person, <laughs> meeting down below, you see where we were all on Zoom. It was actually our best attended meeting we've, we've had ever. Uh, we work together with other groups. Uh, there's not just uh, particle physics, uh, but uh, there are other groups such as astroparticle physics, or nuclear physics, uh, and Gravitational Wave Society who all have outreach organizations there and we connect with them. Uh, and when we have these meetings, we are they're invited and they come and, and give presentations and we share what we're, what we're doing. Um, our last one, which is very, very interesting, we were discussing getting into formal education. Uh, and there's several areas, including uh, New South Wales, where I was recently, where they are adding particle physics as a part of their curricula for high school students, which I think find excellent. Um, we have a variety of communication platforms. You can find us on our web pages. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, they all reach different audiences. Um, please feel free to take a look there, what's going on. And uh, there are ways for you to get involved. Um, we have an IPOG friends. So if you're interested in doing outreach, but you want to stay in touch and know what kind of tools we have on our resource database, for example, uh, you can join our IPOG friends uh, mailing list. For that, you just have to contact me, no problem. Um, the master classes, I won't go in detail, but you can see that the green here that covers the globe is much more than the blue. It's our members. These are the places that we go to give master classes. We go everywhere we possibly can. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, International Particle Physics Master Class, we go primarily to high schools, although we also hit undergraduates as well. We can go into a little bit more detail with undergraduates. We can use uh, some of our, um, our our data from the experiment that, that's that's freely available. For example, we have open data initiatives and, and detailed tools. Um, you become you get a little bit of a lecture. You learn how to use some of the tools, and you do physics for a couple hours, and then report on it. They have a video conference at the end of the day where they report, and those are connected to countries all around the world, usually in the same time zone or similar time zones, let's say. Um, and our reach there was roughly 60 countries uh, all around. Uh, unfortunately, that decreased this year by about a, to, to about a quarter of that because we got stopped because of COVID like everybody else. Um, Global Cosmics, uh, the idea behind that is, it, is, is there to connect schools that all have um, cosmic ray detectors in them. It's an excellent way to learn about particle physics. That's the way we learned about particle physics from people like Victor Hess, 
Um, and, uh, and so we try to connect all those different schools. There's a variety of different programs, some of them trying to do active research, others just primarily counting cosmic rays and looking what happens if you point your detector in different ways, but they're all learning and, and sharing data. So even for schools that don't have that, they can connect and they can see data from schools and they can use that uh, to do work. I'm not going to go into details on the programs, but it's a very exciting program. This It's, it's increasing rapidly right now. Uh, one of our fun activities is Worldwide Data Day. A Worldwide Data Day goes around the globe. We have people in each of the time zones who are there and, uh, and they mentor students and they get some data from the LHC and they, they work on it. So it's really give them a taste of what international collaboration is like taking a shift, for example, international collaboration. Uh, CERN has a program called Beamline for Schools. Uh, in this case, we invite uh, groups of high school students to come over and to get some beam time. They, they actually uh, get access to beam. They have to make a, they have to give us a tweet of a proposal. <laughs> and um, we look at their tweet of intent, I would call it. And we look at their proposals and we get stacks and stacks of proposals. Uh, and we go through them and, and one or two teams get to come to CERN. Now they're going to DAISY because CERN's down for a couple of years while we're upgrading. But uh, we take part in that simply by going through proposals and helping them to write up something that's, that's solid. Uh, finally, we also come around to different uh, public events and, and, and festivals. Uh, our most recent one we just did a week or so ago uh, at our conference uh, iChat called Universal Science, but we also did a variety of fun things that we've supported there. We, we go to music festivals, to um, dance festivals, uh, and reach out to people who wouldn't normally look at science or don't, don't realize yet that they're interested in science and we help them to realize that they are interested in science. So this, this is a lot of, of, of fun that goes on here. So you can take a look at it. There's one of the things that I like to run is called universal science where we discuss not just the science but also diversity and international collaboration. Uh, finally, I just show you that you can find IPOG in the media. Okay, <laughs> you can find lots of things in the media, but uh, it's fun to, to try to pick these out in all the different languages. Uh, and we report in conferences too. We're, we're physicists, so if we go to a conference, we tack on another talk and we present what's going on uh, here. And, and we've been very, very active. We had a whole lot of talks at this past, this past major conference in pseudo Prague, Prague on the internet, we call it. Um, and I think. Uh, it's just about it. I just want to print some, some future challenges that we face. As I mentioned, just a, a couple weeks ago, uh, we completed every every seven years, we, we make a plan for the next seven years of what's going to go out in particle physics. What do we want to do next? Theorists think about what, it, what are the most important things for us to measure and particle physicists look at the technologies and they come up with the different methods and ideas and we discuss and we debate for almost three years we make the plan which is for the next seven years and what's nice is that in this update it was clearly stated uh, these couple statements public engagement education and communication in particle physics uh, should continue to be recognized as important components of the scientific activity and receive adequate support so if you're a student think about that it's good for you uh, you want to learn skills. You want to learn how to do, to build a detector or how to be a theorist or whatever, but you should also add on to that communication skills. They're very important. If you can't communicate what you're doing, you know, start with Aunt Bertha and explain to her what you're doing. That's how you learn to understand yourself what you're doing. It's extremely, extremely important uh, that you can communicate that. Um, we are also working very hard uh, to develop new material to engage the public. And um, and this was a, a message actually to the seniors, the people who will be looking at hiring you guys. And that's this, uh, that, that being involved in outreach should be seen as an integral part of being a scientist and properly valued in terms of career advancement. So we're working for you guys. I'm telling you do outreach and education. And I'm also telling my colleagues, hire students who do outreach and education. Uh, it, it's a good good property to have. And I think that's all I have to say. And this is a picture of, of our very good looking group of people working on particle physics outreach. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Stephen, for the for the great presentation. So, and now, um, again, last but not least, uh, the third speaker, Terence. So, again, I will read you the bio of Terence Rooney. Uh, Terence Rooney serves as the senior program manager for students at uh, and early career career professionals at the Opticus Society of America, of the, uh, which uh, is associ association for people using physics in their academic uh, or professional careers. And uh, it has a portfolio of over uh, 400 uh, student chapters at universities in over 60 countries around the world. Uh, Terence manages th uh, the benefits of that. Uh, each of these chapters receive, in uh, receive uh, funding for general programming, diversity initi initiatives, and traveling lectures. And in the pre-COVID era, Ter Terence enjoyed playing ultimate frisbee. <laughs> so uh, this is, was the bio of Terence. And now, uh, Terence, it's your turn. Thank you, Martin. And, and thank you, IAPS, and uh, specifically Martin and Duarte for having me. Uh, and thank you all for attending this session today. Um, my name is Terence Rooney. I represent the Optical Society. And uh, I see a few familiar faces, uh, Elvira and Natalia. Good to see you guys. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about the Optical Society, my employer, uh, my role at OSA, and also the virtual programming that we've been uh, installing since uh, you know, the era of COVID. So if you're not familiar with OSA, we are an optics association for people using physics in some way in their personal or professional lives. Uh, we have over 23,000 members worldwide, and we interact with almost 400,000 people per year through various uh, conference proceedings, our journals, outreach initiatives, et cetera. Um, we are one of the oldest optics associations. We were founded in 1916, so we are over 100 years old. And um, we are based in Washington, D.C. here in the U.S., but I am actually based in Florida, uh, in Orlando. So if you're familiar with the University of Central Florida or Creel, I'm about 40 minutes from them. And I'm also about 15 minutes from uh, Disney World, which, of course, is no fun right now, but uh, three years ago, or one year ago, I should say, it feels like three years, uh, was a lot of fun. And this is my team. Uh, so my colleague, Jen Meltretter, manages a lot of our early career professional programming, which I'll talk about in, in a bit. And then our boss, Curtis, manages a lot of the foundation grants for individual student members, uh, as well as some of our summer schools. And then I, here I am, uh, 10 pounds lighter, you know, there's the the COVID-15, I, I definitely fall into that category. Uh, as Martin mentioned, I love playing Frisbee. I love being outdoors, but have not been able to do that in the last four months. But these were brighter days about uh, six months ago. Um, but I love to play Frisbee in my personal time. And in my profession, I manage our chapter program here at OSA. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those benefits that we offer. Uh, as Martin mentioned, we have over 400 chapters worldwide uh, in uh, over 62 countries, and I manage the totality of that portfolio. So um, we have quite a lot of benefits for our chapters. We have management grants. So just for general upkeep, uh, ensuring that they can sustain the chapter and also bring on new members, we have grants for that. Uh, if you want to host uh, a special program, we'll provide you up to $1,500 to do so. So perhaps something like this, so a, a webinar series uh, where you're engaging multiple professionals uh, or experts in optics and photonics, and you're melding them with you know, student, interested student attendees. We would give you money to help um, orchestrate an event like that, or you know, in other times, an in-person event. We have a traveling lecture program. So uh, we have a list of about 650 traveling lecturers. These are, these are members that have said, I would love to travel to uh, student chapters and provide a talk. It could be something technical. It could be something related to professional development, career advice, etc. cetera. Um, and you can, as a student chapter, access these benefits, access that portfolio of lecturers, and we'll pay for their travel, we'll pay for their lodging, we'll pay for all of their expenses. So it's a great way for you to interact with these professionals from all over the world. But I also tell new chapters that it's a great way to encourage 
um, membership growth by bringing in someone. We have some Nobel laureates uh, on the list. And if you bring someone to your university, that's going to bring a lot of eyes to, to come see this lecturer speak. And it's a great way to bolster the membership of your chapter, especially if you're just starting out. So that's a great program that we offer. Uh, we have education materials, we have posters, we have kits. I'm sure you've heard of the optic suitcase. It, it, it legitimately looks like a suitcase and it has activities for classrooms of about 50 students, uh, teaching them the powers and principles of optics. Um, we have funding for diversity and inclusion initiatives. And uh, we have ambassador visits and, and a few other things I'm gonna talk about shortly. And then we also have the student leadership conference, very similar to what Haripsi mentioned about uh, EPS. We bring uh, a member from each chapter to Washington DC uh, to participate in, it's a very large scale meeting now. We, we, we pay for your airfare, we pay for your lodging, you get two days of professional development training, and then you get four days of our annual meeting, Frontiers in Optics or FIO, uh, where you can present your, your technical research. So it's a really wonderful op opportunity to engage with you know, this giant network of students. As I mentioned, over 400 student chapters, which equates to more than 6,000 student members. So not all those people are going to the conference, of course, but you do get a, a, a really great element of diversity at the Student Leadership Conference. And in fact, one thing about student leadership, if you are an OSA member uh, this year, and we're actually gonna email everyone this week, uh, it's normally reserved for student chapter members, but we are going to open it up to all student members. So if you would like to attend the three-day virtual conference, uh, all you have to do is sign up, there's no fee. And uh, we've designated time slots to be able to have live sessions for the majority of people that would be attending. So they're based on the East Coast, but at 7 a.m. East Coast time, we have lectures and workshops. And then 7 p.m. East Coast time, we have lectures and workshops. And pretty much across the globe, someone will be able to attend a live session at one of those time slots. So it'd be really interactive, really diverse, and a really great opportunity to engage with other students in optics from all over the world. And then basically very similar to what Haripsi mentioned about starting a student chapter, our, our two primary criteria are you need to have at least five members and they need to be members of the Optical Society. And membership is $20 per year. And then if you are in a developing nation, it's $10 per year. But we understand that even $10 can be a significant amount of money for some countries in a, a developing nation. So we will work with the chapters to uh, help them construct their chapter if they can't meet these criteria. If they can't um, afford the membership price, or I know in certain situations, there aren't a lot of students at those universities. So, uh, universities. so even trying to acquire five is a challenge and we want you to have benefits. So we will work with you to consider you active as long as you're attempting to meet these guidelines. And then of course we want the chapter to submit an, an excuse me an annual report each year just so that we know the level of activity that your chapter has had but also the impact that you are anticipating for the coming year. So those are all benefits that I manage. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about other programs that I'm ma managing virtually, but we also have a variety of student benefits geared toward people that are not part of the student chapter program. And you know, the reason they may not be part of a student chapter is, well, one, there might not be a chapter at that university, or two, they may just not be interested in joining a chapter, which is completely fine. Um, but we have travel grants to a variety of conferences, both in the US and internationally. Uh, we have entrepreneur, entrepreneurship programs, which I'll talk about shortly, networking opportunities with luminaries and optics, and a variety of different programs, totaling about $50,000 per year in the various travel grants, scholarships, and special programs that we offer. So we, we really are here to provide you as students with the opportunities you need to have successful careers in optics and photonics. And then this is just kind of a breakout of some of the, the programs uh, in particular that we offer to student members. Then we also have benefits for early career professionals. So we consider ECPs, people that have um, received their, their degree, whether it be a, a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD, and they've been within a 10 year period of receiving that degree. And we have a variety of different programs specialized and designed for this group of people as well. And uh, you know, two of them that I wanna highlight, one is the Pivoting Fellowship. Uh, this is something that we started, I think, two years ago. 
And it's a $50,000 stipend for a period of one year to allow you as the recipient an opportunity to um, you know, pursue something with your degree that, that may be different, right? So let's say you are in industry, but you've always wanted to perhaps start a company. So you take a sabbatical, we will fund $50,000 of your time uh, so that you can go learn what it takes to start your own company. Or perhaps you're in academia and you're in you know, the US or in the UK, and you've always wanted to uh, promotes education outreach in a developing nation. And you wanna take a year and go to, let's say uh, Africa or South America or parts of India and spend time building uh, you know, a knowledge base there. We would provide you funding to do something outside of what you would normally do with your degree. Uh, so it's a really, really awesome opportunity. Uh, and we also have various fellowships that partner or pair you with companies. In the past, we've partnered with Thor Labs. Uh, we had a fellowship for one of their offices here in the US. Uh, it was a one year term with the option to extend to three years. And it's just a great way to, again, um, be able to introduce yourself to new realms of possibilities with your degree. Oops. Then we have a really neat program. This is now, we're gonna be in our sixth year, the OSA Ambassador Program. So if you're an early career professional, you can apply to be an ambassador. I think last year we had close to 150, maybe 200 applications. It's very competitive. We take the top 10. And at the start of the program, we bring all the ambassadors to Washington, DC, and we provide them with uh, professional development training, how to interact with our student members, right? And we also pair them with our volunteers because early in the year, we have a uh, winter leadership meeting where all the volunteers, the OSA board, the board of directors for publications, for meetings, all get together to discuss policy and strategy. And it's a great opportunity for us to pair the ambassadors with these volunteers so that we open doors for them to serve in these committees as well. Um, we will pay for the ambassadors then to travel to student chapters, engage them from a technical perspective, from professional development perspectives. And uh, really it's a, a fantastic benefit for both our student members who get to access this benefit because chapters do get to invite one ambassador per year to, to in a similar way uh, of a traveling lecturer, attend their university and, and give a talk on whatever topic it might be that interests them, that chapter. Um, but it's also a fantastic program for the ambassadors themselves and helping grow their career uh, into from an early career professional into an established professional. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful program. And if you have graduated or if you're graduating soon, I would highly encourage you to check this program out. And then I wanna talk a little bit about virtual programming. What is it that we are doing now in lieu of COVID? Well, we've had to change a lot of our programming as I'm sure many of you had uh, to do um, to offer these programs virtually, which we normally have them on site uh, or in person. It all started really with this We Are On campaign. I think we started this in about May when we recognized that a lot of people are not gonna be traveling for quite some time. Uh, so this is basically a virtual, uh, conference, not conference, it's a virtual series. Each week we have webinars. Sometimes there are two or three webinars per week. Sometimes there are 10 on any number of topics, technical or professional development related. Uh, and if you're an OSA member, you can access these for free. They're also recorded and put into a deposit or a repository and uh, you can access them later uh, if you weren't able to attend live. So it all started with this We Are On campaign, ensuring that we can provide content that we normally would uh, in person in a virtual space. One thing that the foundation at OSA did was we offered uh, free Zoom accounts, well, one year professional Zoom accounts to uh, our student chapter. So initially we wanted to provide headsets, webcams, uh, but of course with things being closed, there were no manufacturing uh, or little manufacturing was occurring. And it was very challenging in the very beginning when we, when we started this program to find any company, even uh, a local store that had these cameras or, or headsets available. So we switched to Zoom accounts um, and we offered 72 Zoom accounts to our chapters. And a lot of them have been participating um, in routine chapter management meetings or meetings like this one where you are engaging your membership and trying to get them in, uh, interacting with either one another or professionals in the field. So it's been a, a wonderful thing that we could provide to our chapter members. And this is one of our chapters um, participating in a, in a meeting last month. 
We also have the career calibrator. So this is essentially the We Are On campaign before it was We Are On. Uh, we started the career calibrator about three years ago. And it is just, a, again, an online repository of uh, webinars, of conference proceedings, of virtual engagement that you can access at any time for any purpose to assist your career. We also have something that I manage called the IONS program. So these are three to five day conferences that about five to seven chapters are selected to host each year. They include technical programming, they include the professional development side, and they also include a societal element. They're really great because the university can showcase their labs, but also the city in which their university is in. And, and it's so wonderful. I was talking to uh, Ripsy about, uh, I attended IONS Yerevan, uh, I think it was two years ago. And just so amazing to see so many different cultures. And uh, this is an opportunity that the students of that chapter, I mean, they really take the lead on. OSA provides the funding, we provide the structure, we provide marketing, we provide lecturers, but the programming itself is all designated and determined by the chapters. And they do a wonderful job doing this. And you know, we offered this year, we were supposed to have ions in Mexico, Ireland, Portugal, uh, China, Australia, and we offered them the opportunity to go virtual or postpone until 2021. So all of them postponed with the exception of Mexico. They said, we want to be the first virtual IONS ever. And so they hosted their conference as they normally would. It was completely virtual and it was uh, a resounding success. They had, I think, 350, if not more attendees over the course of the, the four day period. And it was wonderful to see so many people uh, from so many different countries be able to interact with one another. And that's one of the beauty, uh, beautiful things about this, this virtual era that we find ourselves in is the ability to have that accessibility, uh, which otherwise may not have been there, uh, and the exposure of you know, this content, especially as a student, to be able to relate and engage with other students from across the world. So IONS and Puma did a fantastic job of, of really on the fly transitioning their in-person program to a virtual one, and it, it was a resounding success. We also have a variety of other summer schools. So the innovation school is something we started two or three years ago. It is for uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, if you have a business idea and it can be an optics and photonics or it can be a, a dog grooming service, uh, we bring you to Washington DC. It's a three day program and we pair you with experts in entrepreneurship to help you take that idea from conceptualization to actually crafting and implementing a business plan. So it's a really wonderful opportunity if you're interested in starting your own company to find out exactly what goes on uh, behind the scenes and what you should be preparing for in terms of, you know, uh, trademarking that idea and overcoming certain challenges that, that may be in the way as you uh, try to implement this idea into a reality. Um, so this year it was virtual. Uh, you can kind of see the background here. There's a bunch of little tables. So we've been using this program called Remo and I'll put it in the chat feature. Um, it's Remo Conference. And what's really cool about it is it's kind of a combination of Zoom or Google Meet with like this visual perspective of actually being in a conference setting. Um, so when you're at these little tables, they're actually like breakout tables. So if you are at table one, only people at table one can converse with each other, much like if you were in a, a separated room at a conference, right? Uh, but then you can go into this presentation mode like we are now, uh, where you have speakers that are engaging the audience. Um, in, in this way that we're, we're used to through, through Zoom or Google Meet. So it's a really cool take on this virtual environment that we've been getting a lot of positive feedback on. So if you're looking to host these types of events, I would recommend looking into this Remo tool because it's, it's really, really awesome and really different and unique. And you can customize the layout and the colors and all that stuff. Uh, but we hosted Innovation School this way and it was, it was uh, a success. We also have the Siegman School on Lasers, which is normally a week-long program. Uh, we have Stephen Chu, Nobel Laureate, and Eric Mazur from Harvard University um, that really led the charge this year. And um, again, we had over 100 participants. It was um, a wonderful way to engage with students um, over a five-day period. We also had the Subsea Mini Dive. So last year we partnered with Google on the uh, Subsea Conference for Optical Fibers. 
And uh, we had to transition it again virtually, and we did so using that Remo platform. And we had a lot of great conversations with uh, experts in fiber optics, including Vincent Cerf, who is known as one of the fathers of the internet. Uh, really wonderful opportunity for students to um, you know, join uh, this kind of conference platform again, similar to Siegman, to IONS, to Innovation School, just a different topic, um, but just trying to keep the engagement going in this virtual world we, we find ourselves in. Then we also have this other cool program that we've been, we've been working on. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Tom Baer. He's at Stanford University, and he's created a uh, decontamination chamber for N95 masks. So one thing that we're finding uh, from uh, the literature and, and from the news is that you know a lot of countries, especially developing nations, are being challenged by the availability of uh, personal protective equipment uh, for clinicians. So the goal is to build these structures which will decontaminate those so that the physicians can use them for at least a period of five additional times before they have to throw them away, which in many of these countries we're partnering in, uh, and those materials are scarce to begin with. So this is a wonderful way to uh, kind of assist and protect those clinicians in those high density environments when COVID, where COVID is, is really playing a, a large role in impacting that community. So we surveyed a, a variety of our student chapters in Latin America, in India, uh, in parts of Asia, and we have 27 groups that we've now partnered with. We are funding the construction of these uh, chambers. We're partnering the student chapters with people like Tom or with clinicians that are partnered with this, uh, this particular initiative. Uh, so if there are technical questions about building the, uh, the chamber itself or trying to leverage the chamber uh, in a hospital setting and building protocols, uh, we have people on site and on staff to kind of help the chapters, uh, guide the chapters in that way. So it's Really, we're in the middle of the process. We have about half that have started building the chambers. One or two have actually implemented the chambers in a hospital setting. And we have about half that are still kind of constructing the chambers, ordering the materials, uh, or starting the relationships with those local hospitals. So it's a really great opportunity um, for the chapters to stay engaged with the community and really have a, a tangible impact, uh, especially in this COVID environment, uh, on their local community. So. And these are just some photos of, of chapters in, in certain locations that are constructing the kits. You can see they're having fun with it. They're all masked up, which is great. Um, and it's just been a really cool initiative to work on. And then that's generally uh, my presentation. Uh, I thank you for your time and I look forward to addressing any questions you may have about OSA or our activities or, or my role in the company. So thank you. So Terence, thank you very much. And again, thank you all three for the wonderful presentations. So now we will move on to the Q&A. And here the first question will be for Hipsy. Um, you mentioned in your presentation uh, the under-equipped schools for, uh, in Armenia, which uh, may, uh, uh, I would guess it would pose a big problem for uh, physics outreach uh, efforts in Armenia, but uh, you seem to make uh, you seem to use it as opportunity for for actually creating the equipment and uh, education just educating the students. So I wonder uh, what have been the main challenges or you you specifically encountered, or what are the main challenges that anyone uh, trying to do a physics out, uh, outreach will face? Right, yes, uh, actually, um, it's uh, for, thank you for the question. And actually, in different countries, the, um, the problem is different. So in one country, you do not need to go to the schools because they have a special classes for that, special things to, uh, to make uh, kids close to the science. And um, countries in Armenia, uh, like Armenia, there is a problem actually uh, in the schools as the Books are designed mainly for a theoretical part of the science and going to the schools and making some kind of experiments uh, or um, making them to be wonder because of the science, it's very easy, I guess, because the only uh, challenge for us was to find the funding to go there because it's far from the city and it's not like 
uh, usual countries. It's not uh, easy to reach to the villages, which is far from the uh, capital where we are based. Uh, so that it, it was a challenge to find transportation, to find uh, things, materials, and so on. But uh, all schools are welcomed us, so they were uh, waiting for us because it is something new refreshment for their kids. They can uh, they can see what the the other side from uh, of the science. So they heard that uh, physics and chemistry and, or biology is very difficult. They do not want to learn it because uh, they only know books. They know only things which is written there, and they do not know why they are learning that. So you need to show them why the science is for and where they can find the science rules. Say when you are showing that science is with you with everyday life, it's helping them to be more engaged and they, it's helping them to be more happy with that. And they are helping you to introduce like they are coming with you. They, they are asking lots of questions and the big um, like, uh, opportunity and encouragement for the student is that they are learning doing that. So in a school, in a university, it's a usual uh, student's life and they do not know, need to sit and read uh, like simple things which they haven't uh, heard about. So when they are going to the schools, they know that they need to answer questions which can be very simple, but have very uh, like a detailed answer. So it is, um, it is all encouragement and inspiration of the students. So I think if uh, in the countries uh, like Armenia, they want to do that, they should start from one uh, village and then they will find the way how to make it bigger and bigger. So if there, if there is any country which wants to do that, they can apply and be part of the uh, uh, like um, sections which have been uh, represented here. And I think they will be funded to do the, that kind of outreach events for the schools. I hope that I have answered it to your question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so I forgot to say this, but um, every time I ask a question, um, I will ask uh, one of you, but then I will ask uh, the others if they want to add something to, to that question. So uh, Steven, would you, would you like to add some uh, problem, uh, problems that may face, uh, that someone who uh, wants to do physical outreach will, will face? Well, I think uh, Ripsy uh, touched on it very well. I mean, it really depends. Um, place to place, country to country, or and within countries also it can vary uh, depending on socioeconomic status uh, of the students. Um, when we do master classes, um, we, we, I think that what's happened naturally is the programs that we've set up uh, are the common denominators. So um, if we do something like master classes, it will depend on the level of the students. Uh, we start with the basic concept that they have no idea <laughs> what, what is particle physics or what we try to do. And then it's up to us to bring them up to par uh, in, in the morning, feed them some food, and then have them do some work in the afternoon. Um, but you can, you can do this, I think, in almost any place. Uh, the question of whether or not they've been exposed before or whether they'll be exposed afterwards is, is, is very important. Trying to stay in touch with them. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You need local researchers. I think for most of the time when we're trying to do outreach, the most important thing for us to do is to establish some link that, that can stay. Try to train some local teachers and get some local researchers to be involved. So that, which means naturally that it's most difficult in a country it doesn't have any connection whatsoever to particle physics, then it's the biggest challenge that we have. We're not going to find researchers. We have to nurture that program. And, uh, and maybe it's just not yet ready for that. They need to work on other things that they have opportunities to meet researchers in. Um, but otherwise, but with COVID, maybe, maybe we're going to overcome that. For a long time, we've been trying to develop tools which can work out of the box and uh, don't depend on there being an expert in particle physics nearby. If they could come to our website, find that, see how it relates to their curriculum and go through it. So it's, it's challenging us, challenges coming back to us to develop tools 
uh, which can be used by anybody and which don't scare teachers. Uh, <laughs> don't tell the teachers, but uh, we're primarily dealing with high school, but even in some places in university level, particle physics is something that they consider to be abstract, very difficult. They want to stay away from it. It scares them. They don't want to stick that in their curricula. Uh, and so we have to come up with ways that show it's, you know, conservation and momentum. No big deal. <laughs> and uh, so we, we face those challenges. Um, and I think anybody with a little bit of in innovation can, can do that. Thank you. Uh, Terence, do you want to add anything to this question? Yeah, I echo what Stephen and Haripsi mentioned about it being, um, you know, relative to the location of, of where the outreach is occurring. Uh, I think from the very beginning, it starts with just the uh, ability to try, right? Um, depending on how comfortable you are with engaging your community, much like science, it's trial and error. So uh, I, I, I connected with a variety of our student members who uh, from anywhere to undergraduate and PhD students that have never really been out in the field, so to speak, in this way. And it, it's scary, right? But don't be afraid to try something, see how it works and, and tweak later. So I think first and foremost, just be willing to address these outreach uh, concerns by, by trying. Um, I think also trying to think outside the box. Um, you know, in a physical environment, I know that um, we have chapters that, you know, host these outreach events in, in normal academic settings. There are some chapters that are in Italy that had this cool concept, I think it's so, so unique, where they actually go to bars and they set up their optical experiments. And, you know, the, the people there are just looking to drink, but they're naturally curious about what the hell is going on over here with, with these lights and these lenses and lasers. And it's a great way to just kind of outside the box, introduce people to, again, the powers and principles of, of physics. Um, and in a virtual environment, I think the same can be said. I was talking to Stephen and, and Haripsi earlier about uh, we're starting to notice a little bit of virtual burnout because there are so many opportunities online now with, with all of us being closed in. So I think it's important to try to figure out ways that you can uh, structure your outreach events in a way that may be a little different or a little more engaging um, just to separate them from the crowd and also keep people's interest because it is a little more difficult when we are so far away from one another to really hone in and focus on on the content being presented and maybe that's an icebreaker at the beginning maybe that's a you know like a different software i'm not sure you kind of have to again trial and error uh, try it yourselves but don't be afraid to attempt different things and see what the outcome or the results are um and then, you know, I think Stephen touched on this, being able to translate science to the general public. Uh, something may be simple for you as a student, uh, but for someone with no expertise in, in the subject matter, it may be extremely difficult. So uh, just be mindful of your audience and who you're trying to address and be able to convey the message in a way that they would understand. I'm sorry to interrupt. I forget how to click up my little blue hand, but <laughs> just to add to exactly what Terrence said is very important. One other thing you should know, you're not alone. Uh, and if you look around, there's a lot of stuff out there. There are, there are tools out there that you can use. Um, I, in, in particle physics, I often go to uh, QuarkNet's site. So QuarkNet uh, is, is an organization funded by the National Science Foundation. And they go to schools, they do master classes all over the US and else in Mexico, Canada, all around. And um, they have some really great little programs there. You can go to their site and you can say, okay, I wanna do something new. Uh, rolling for, for um, Rutherford, you know, a little game where you can set up cans and throw balls and calculate cross sections. Uh, measuring the weights of pennies and putting up their distribution with stick it notes. There's all sorts of little things which are really easy to do. And, and, and EPS has, has a, a lot of these as well. You can find um, various games and things you can, you can choose from. So there are tools out there. True. Okay, great, thank you. So I think we can move on to the second question. So this one will be for Steven, or we will start with Steven. 
and then uh, all of you will, will have an uh, opportunity to say something about it. So um, a bit of background. Um, I feel there's a bit of uncertainty about uh, carriers in physics. For example, I know uh, a lot of people who are uh, who were very interested in physics in high school, for example, but ended up studying something else, uh, for example, IT, uh, mostly because they did not know what they would do, for example, with their job, uh, which you also, I think, touched on in your presentation, uh, what to believe and what to do. Uh, so, um, do you have any way of um, generally answering such doubts from physics students if a student comes uh, up to you and uh, asks you uh, why sh he should study particular physics? Uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's several answers to that. First, she or he should do what they want to do. Right, you, you got one life. They should they should do the thing that, that they love, and if, if they really love doing physics, they should do it. They should pursue it. It doesn't mean I can't guarantee you're going to get a job in in what it is that they really want. There's that possibility, but you can't be afraid of that. You you really need to go forward. And the reason I can tell you you don't have to be afraid of that is because if you do pursue a degree, if you pursue a higher degree, especially a master's degree or a PhD. In, in something that seems, you know, that there aren't that many jobs in particle physics, to give an example. More than half of the particle physics PhDs don't stay in the field. They, they end up leaving. But the degree is extremely valuable in any physics, right? You're, you're learning how to solve problems. You're learning, you, there's, 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 a, there's the skills, right? You learn how to program whatever you program in now, uh, you, you, you learn how, you know, you learn how to, um, different languages doesn't matter, the basic idea of programming. You learn uh, how to build electronics, you, but most importantly, you, you, you learn how to solve problems. And that's recognized out there. So in industry, if you end up going into industry, or if you end up going into another field of science, it's recognized that the tools that you're learning in physics are extremely valuable. You're someone who will solve a problem. You will work day and night to solve a problem. Uh, and, and that, so, so it's valuable. So number one, do the thing that you really love, period. Then you'll never work a day in your life. Right? That's, I'm stealing someone's quote. Uh, and uh, if it should happen that you chose physics and you can't find uh, a career directly in the field you studied, don't worry about it. There's a lot of other things out there that you, you can do and that might grab your interest. Not everybody who went out into the field of IT, for example, did it because they couldn't find a job in particle physics. They found that they really loved doing programming. And so they went into that too. So don't worry, that's, that's, my, that's my message, I guess, don't worry. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, Terence, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I agree with Stephen completely and his first point, uh, do what you love, if that's physics, if that's something else, you know, just, and I know it's not easy to find out what that is sometimes. Um, and then the only other thing I would add is just do not be afraid to leverage relationships in your field, um, whether they're other student members, whether they are your professor, people that you've interacted with at a conference, uh, because these are how you do open doors to the career realm. Um, and a lot of the, um, I think there's an iceberg metaphor for the job market. A lot of the jobs are under the water and you don't necessarily see them pop up until it's too late. So don't be afraid to connect with people um, that are in optics and photonics to figure out what is out there, what are the possibilities, or you know, to help you determine what you might want to do. Is academia right for me? Is industry right for me? And do I want to start my own company? Um, so just network with one another. Okay, nice. Thank you. Hertzi, do you want to add anything? Actually, uh, thank you for, uh, for the uh, like uh, ideas which you have mentioned here. Actually, uh, really, uh, the, if someone will ask me, I will just say that there is no bad profession. There is a bad specialist. So if you're deciding to be a scientist or you want to go to industry, it's uh, your own uh, like decision. But uh, being the scientist is like uh, living a different life 
and being the, the part of different communities. So if you want, uh, like it depends on the uh, decision what you are making. So you want to uh, build the knowledge or you want to create something or you want just work for, for someone. You do not want to uh, like, um, make a heavy your mind with the other stuff or you just want to do something which they are telling you so it's uh, completely different what do you want from life you want to explore or you want to just do something uh, so uh, I completely agree with the ideas which was uh, like mentioned here and uh, I will actually when I, someone is asking me what to do I'm just definitely saying uh, come uh, for the science because if you will be a good specialist you will find a job you will find a place you will build your career it's definitely that uh, you will never ever have a problems if you decide to do the science because you will find a way how to do that. Thank you, Martin. Okay, thank you all for the second question. Um, and now uh, on to the third question. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll start with Terence. Um, what do you think uh, are the are generally the most important things? Um, you, you touched on this and, and also Stephen touched on this a, a bit uh, in the first question. But uh, what do you think are the most important things for inspiring uh, students uh, to, to study physics or study technical pro pro uh, programs? And uh, also generally, to, uh, what do you think is most important for um, getting uh, uh, students or people generally to do meaningful things in their lives, like individual people? Oh, tough questions. Uh, these are philosophical questions. I like them. Um, I think this is also something that varies uh, person to person. What inspires someone uh, to the left of me may inspire no one to the right of me. Um, but I think depending on the age group, like if we're focusing on uh, a younger population, I think one thing that's important is trying to keep it fun, trying to keep it exciting. Um, and I, again, I don't know what that is. I've seen various examples that chapters do. They, they bring in like gimmicks or maybe they, like I, I love, and this is just a simple thing, but I love Tripsy's slide with all the little Star Wars characters. Like just incorporating silly elements like that can have a, a lasting impact on keeping someone's attention to your presentation. Um, so trying to make it as fun as possible. And again, depending on, on the level of understanding that your audience has, as simple as possible. Because uh, I had a boss that used to say, confused minds say no. And I agree with that. I think when generally, if you are confused by something and you think it's way too complex, uh, you don't want to learn any more about it. So trying to uh, not dumb it down is the wrong word, but trying to simplify your your concept, your idea, uh, so that it can be uh, understood by the most amount of people uh, is is important. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Herbs, do you want to add anything to this question? Mm, actually, uh, I, I would like to just say that you need to take examples from life. In that case, uh, it will uh, bring the attention because sometimes uh, students, kids, or so on, they do not know how, uh, why to learn the science, why to learn physics. And so if you are bringing the examples from life, which they are faced all the time, uh, they, they are starting to focus and understand why it's happened. So they are finding the answers which they are looking for. Uh, so I, I completely agree with Terence. And so it's, um, the, the same, I would add the same. You know, it's funny too, is I, I've seen uh, middle school and elementary school kids uh, at like science fairs, like, oh, why should I care about optics? And, and you know, professors just raise their phone and like, okay, you're on this all day. Uh, this is optics in action. So you wanna learn what, what goes into building something like this? Mm -hmm. um, it's science. Actually, I had a, another example when I was uh, presenting about lightnings at school. Uh, like I, I was asking, what question do you have? And they were asking why uh, the beam of the car is uh, turning on when the lightning is happening in the yard. And I was like, how they have uh, like 
uh, taking into account. I was never ever I was thought about. So they were thinking what uh, affection and what can bring it. And I was like, I was just focused on to, to teach them how it's happen and so on. But it's always um, the way like they want to understand what's happening around them. Oh, thank you. Those were great examples. So, Stephen, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, they both covered so much. <laughs> it's really good. Um, in my mind, I mean, when we start out, um, when we're little kids, um, we're thrilled by science. It's, it's, it's natural. Uh, it, it's, um, you know, we're uh, as human beings you know, we're pretty we're, we're still simple animals let's face it i mean we we we, we eat and, and and we make babies and and we examine the world around us try to understand it and convey that and people do that in many different ways but this is how we survive right you need all these things to survive the it, it's maybe a little bit longer before you see the results especially of my field it might take generations you know i was asked uh, uh, I was asked on a show called 60 Minutes in the U.S. These, these guys are very well-known journalists, and um, uh, I was asked, you know, what it's been? It's been five years since you you found the Higgs boson. What do we have for it? Uh, <laughs> it was a it was a, it was actually a really good question because that's what everybody has on their mind. Is so, what does this stuff give us? Uh, it, it takes time. I mean, I just. All I could say is that you, you know you got the right question, but it's the wrong time. You got to ask my great great grandchild. Uh, I don't know what the Higgs mobile is going to look like, but it's going to be great. But you know, it's it's guaranteed. Science does great things. So I think that naturally it's built into our DNA that we look at the world around us and then we explain what we see to the rest of the world. Some of us like to do this through the formalization of science. Others make art or make music. Uh, it, but it's 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 already in us. I think what's what's a, it's a shame is that sometimes it gets lost uh, between when we're a child and when we end up going to electromagnetism 421 and are formalizing Maxwell's equations or something. You know, we're doing something that that starts to get rather tedious, and then we start to to lose the connection. So exactly as as both Terence and Ripsy have said, that that connection with the real world again. If you can just reignite that and say, yeah, you know the fourth power of the frequency. That's why the sky is blue. Uh, and, and if you go through that, that lesson reminds you of why everything that we're doing is relevant, why it's interesting, why it's, it's, it's extremely important for humankind if we want to survive to continue doing what we're doing. Um, just have to, you just have to remind them. It's, it's already in them, I think. Wow, <laughs> thank you all for the great answers. So on to the next question. Um, before the official start of this session, uh, we talk a bit uh, about um, COVID and uh, Terence touched on it quite a bit, but um, I, I think it would be useful for uh, all the people attending to hear it again from us. So, um, uh, whoever likes, we can start with Herpsy. Uh, could you uh, comment a bit on the posit positive side from the uh, of the COVID pandemic and uh, uh, on the physics outreach? Uh, yes. Uh, so the uh, beside the negative sides of the COVID, we had a positive ones because uh, uh, using the Zoom or other platforms, we can connect each other any time of the day and uh, from everywhere. So we can speak about the science, uh, like um, speak about what to do together and also invite professors or uh, any specialists uh, around the world to have a just a Skype or a Zoom meeting there. And so we can learn more. Uh, actually, yes, yeah, sometimes uh, Zoom platform is like, uh, some. So, uh, some ones are using it not in the right way. They like they do not enjoy the meetings. They do not pay attention what they are uh, telling about. But in general, it um, it's giving a lot of opportunities because now we have developed more connection and more possibilities than before the pandemic time. And uh, con connecting with um, outreach event, for instance, we had a small uh, examples when uh, we had the kids 
and we have done the experiments together with them. So, so they had uh, uh, tools which we are using uh, together, and they were, when uh, we were explaining them, okay, use this and then this, and you will get it. So they were learned by Zoom as well. So, yeah, I think that you need to learn how to make problems possibilities, like how to transfer them. If you find the problems, don't escape them. Just try to make to to use them to make a possibility. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Stephen, do you want to add anything? And I will, I will just uh, make a quick note. If some one of you doesn't want to add something, you can just say no. I don't want to add anything. So, Stephen, <laughs> he's saying we, we have the ability to talk uh, <laughs> anyway. But I know uh, I, I'm actually I don't have a lot to add, Terpsy. I, I think I said before, you know, we're we're trying very hard uh, to make to make our packages, our programs be self-containing so that people can can, can follow them that we're, we're learning the necessity of that and in our last meeting we dedicated to actually bringing some teachers on board and someone from the edu department of education to come talk with us about how we can reach further by being you know entirely remote it's it's a little tricky because master class the name master class uh, comes from the idea that there's the master comes and sees you and she tells you what her research is and that inspires you. Uh, and, you know, that to do it without that is it's not really a masterclass, it's, it's a class. <laughs> um, but we can make it less formal, uh, like Terence has referred to doing things which are a little bit less formal. So um, we're working on that. And also we can bring the master remotely that's that's another thing that we can try to do for this so we're we're working very hard to try to fill in this void because we don't know if next year we'll be able to do master classes again uh, we usually do this in the springtime we have a couple months there um, and if we can't we're trying to set a program so we'll be able to uh, do it all remotely um, I'll miss that it's it's really fun working with students but um, Okay, we do what we have to do, just like Ripsy said, make make do, it's a problem, solve it, you're a scientist. <laughs> yes, and but you had a very nice idea about uh, merging them, like conferences and uh, some meetings as well. Yeah, I hope I hope we're able to do that and to learn from this so that in the future, when we're all healthy again and don't have to worry about shaking hands, we still consider bringing in the world. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Terence? I think the only other thing that I would add is take advantage while you can, because I don't know of a time where experts have been more available, right? Generally, if you're traveling to uh, a physical location, you're out for that period of time, right? You can't go visit students in Geneva if you're uh, in the US or Australia or China, uh, whereas now you can meet with all those countries <laughs> in one day. Um, and I, I have a, a strong suspicion that once COVID is, has passed, uh, there will be a lot of conferences, a lot of travel right at the beginning, trying to capture that moment of, hey, we got to get back in a physical space. And there's going to be a lot of competition for people's time and attention. So right now, while there is availability, I would strongly urge students to leverage those relationships with people in the field and, and get them to, to give a talk on whatever it is you're interested in. Great, thank you all again. So I have a few more questions here and we have some, still some time. So now we will start with Steven. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, how do you think the outlook on physics has been evolving throughout the years? Uh, for example, have you noticed through uh, the efforts of, of uh, IPOC, uh, an increase in interest or in physics, or, or not just through IPOC, but generally? I, I have to admit that I don't know everybody in the world yet. Um, I'm trying to get to that. Uh, so, so it's hard for me to gauge very well for any of us to gauge. I know that our programs are continually expanding. Right. So we're bringing master classes to more and more places. 
and there's very few that are dropping out. Um, it, it can depend on the people. Uh, I know an example in the in the U.S. we have 50 different centers for QuarkNet, and some of them join, some of them do drop out because whoever was championing it, whatever the teacher was, uh, disappeared. Um, but for the most part, I mean, I, I think, as I said before, I think you know it's it's natural inside us that we like physics. It's it's, it's science. We were it's it's programmed into us. Um, and I think I think we're we're way behind in communication. Um, I think that's you know something that, that we all have to learn how to do better, and maybe we're going to learn it now with, with Zoom meetings and all of this. But we need uh, to reach more and more people. The more you reach them, the the, the, the more the the interest increases. I think just a lot of people have no idea that we're doing all these really cool programs. They just don't know about it. Um, one thing that we try to do now a little bit more is, is get um, people who have big platforms uh, to, to be involved. So big names uh, in, in different areas in the arts, in music, for example, uh, we bring them to do visits, to come visit CERN. CERN is a great place. I just have to bring someone in bring them underground 100 meters and then they're sold. They love it. There's, there's no, it's not much you have to do because you have these enormous, beautiful uh, detectors. And, and um, you know, once once they see that, uh, they, you know, they, they say, OK, this is a great thing. You know, I'll just give you I'll just I'll just go there now myself. You know, um, you know, once you see a thing like this and this is not even to scale, it's bigger than that. All right. Um, it, it, so so one of my colleagues, uh, she likes to bring um, celebrities. She's she's helping to do big programs in different places at music festivals and things like this. Um, we brought over, you know, the, a tweet by Will I Am in front of this wheel blew away any of the tweets that we did when we discovered the Higgs boson. Okay, <laughs> statistics wise, we can't compete. So I think that we we have great programs. The interest is there, it's inherent in all people. And the more we're able to communicate, to use these platforms to go out there and get to people, uh, the more interest will just continue to, to grow. We've seen what a complete an utter moron can do when they have a really big platform to talk on. I'm not gonna say who that is, uh, but uh, you know, maybe some bright people can try to use these platforms a little bit better and 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 then you'll see interest grow even even more but in general i would say yes i, I see interest increasing no, thank you very much Stephen. uh so terence uh any anything you want to add on the evolution of interest in physics throughout the years uh well firstly i apologize for american politics i know it <laughs> makes the world a little crazier uh given our our current regime. Um, but uh, no, I think Stephen uh, summarized it very well. So nothing further to add. OK, uh, Herbsy, do you want to add anything? Actually, my internet was uh, like not stable that. Uh, but um, I just want to say that um, the um, like Mm, the way how you are treating it, it will can uh, have an influence on that. Like, if you will uh, have a special um, political uh, views, how to make you know, bigger interest of uh, society to be engaged to the science, it will help. Uh, now in countries like Armenia, it is a big problem, but I guess in uh, several countries it's not like that. But if you want to uh, make students or kids to be uh, more uh, close to the science, you need to have a special rules for that. And now, I do not know, it, it, it in my country, it's not like increased. Uh, we have a decrease uh, now because not all of them want to be to stay in science. They, uh, not all of them want to uh, be a scientist because it's not giving money and they want to go to IT or other other spares to work and they, they are not encouraged to stay. But uh, like um, EPS Young Minds or OSA or SBIE or other uh, communities helping them to be 
to make a fun and helping them to uh, to find or explore what uh, career of scientists can give them. So I am ex I am ex extremely encouraging them to stay there and uh, to find uh, to try to find opportunities. Great, thank you for the answers. Uh, now I will ask one more question, uh, a bit more pro personal one. And uh, but uh, I would like to ask uh, the people in the audience uh, to submit questions, uh, whether it's uh, through Facebook, uh, Discord, uh, Jupiter, and where we are streaming. And um, so, so we, if you have any questions for for the speakers, you, you please ask them now. And uh, so now for the question. So we will start with Terence. Um, and uh, it's a bit personal question. So uh, Terence, could you tell us a bit about your personal student path and, and professional career uh, and how, how uh, outreach act activity has fit into it? Sure, so uh, I've always been interested in people. Uh, I agree with Stephen, I think we're born with natural curiosity. Uh, we're meant to be explorers and I've always been curious about my fellow, uh, my fellow man and woman. Um, so my background is actually not in physics, it's in sociology. I'm a sociologist by, by profession, um, but I happened upon this opportunity with the Optical Society and it, it fit exactly what I was trying to do, um, leverage uh, expertise that people are providing to impact society and bridge gaps between uh, all sorts of groups of people. So um, I you know, have been with OSA for seven years now. I started in the foundation doing a lot of fundraising and program management and creation. Um, so for Siegman School, when we were raising money for that program, we, I think it's still the largest foundation program, over a million dollars raised. I was a part of that initiative. Uh, in the last four years now, I've been in this chapter role where I've been engaging with our 7,000 student members. And uh, it's just been a, a real treat to see just how excited you as students are when you talk about your research, when you talk about the impacts that you can have uh, on humanity. And, um, you know, it's just a really wonderful opportunity to be involved in this field. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Herxie, would you like to tell us anything about your personal career path and how outreach activity has fit into it? Uh, yes, actually, in the beginning, um, I have forced a lot of uh, problems uh, because uh, being a woman and being a scientist in Armenia is really uh, difficult. But then I just started to transfer problems to the opportunities. And I started to make connections over the world and started to collaborate with different scientific groups. And now I have established two scientific uh, collaboration in my institute. Uh, and now I'm working with international uh, professors and specialists and uh, writing papers and uh, doing stuff together with them. So it's helping a lot. And I just uh, want to say if someone will uh, just find any problem, just not run away from that. Just try to change something. Okay, thank you, Herpsy. So, Steven, would you like to tell us anything about your career path? Sure, you've got an hour or so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, like half hour, maybe. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's hard to come after Ripsy after that wonderful speech she just gave there. Um, I, you know, stumbled into it, and this happens with a lot of people as well. You know, I was convinced uh, in high school to apply to schools to go to medical school. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, when I, got, I went to the University of Michigan, firmly in mind that I was going to, to do that. Uh, and then didn't take too long to find out. I think it was when I bought my organic chemistry book uh, that I, I brought it back the same day <laughs> uh, and changed my path and decided I wanted to study mathematics. And studied mathematics, I got my undergraduate degree in mathematics. But in my senior year, I thought, what, 
what am I going to do with mathematics? <laughs> this is fun. It's interesting, but I like it when it's applied to something. So then I decided on physics. Maybe it's a compromise. Um, clearly going to be a theoretical physicist because that's what you do when you when you go into physics and you have a background in mathematics. I was going to you know, be the next Einstein. And then I got a phone call saying, hey, we need someone to help us you know, come over to Switzerland and work on a detector. And within a month, I was an experimentalist. Uh, so be flexible. It's, it's a lesson of all this. Be flexible. I, I, all these things interested me. Um, I, I found my path by getting into particle physics. I mean, building things like this is incredible to see, you know, from pulling cables all the way through to seeing the first data is an amazing thing. Uh, so I stuck with that and, I, and, I, and I've loved it. Uh, ever since. Um, I was not so involved in education and outreach in my early career. I was doing physics analysis. It's what you have to do what they have to do, you know, pull cables and write code and, and, uh, and, and I, I did physics analysis on the LEP accelerator. And I came over to the LHC and uh, was coordinated the software for this big wheel back here, the, the whole muon system and, and enjoyed that. Um, uh, once they saw how good I was with hardware, they told me that I should be a software coordinator. Uh, so I so I did that, uh, and uh, and and that was that was tremendous fun. But then, as we got close to the LHC turning on, there was a lot of interest by the media, and they looked for people who could talk, and they looked for people, I guess, maybe with simple minds like me, who could explain to simple simple terms. Uh, how things worked. And so I just sort of got recruited into that, went through media training. You don't do this without getting trained. Uh, it took a lot to train physicists to do communication. It's not just something you just do. Uh, and I'm still working on it. Um, sometimes I can complete a sentence even. Uh, but, you know, you, you learn. And when I got involved with that and did different interviews and things like this, I started to learn more and more. I started to ask myself questions. I did lots of visits with people. As you do visits and people ask you questions, half the time you won't be able to answer. That's okay, but you learn and you start to develop an, a, a process in your mind of how to explain things. You just follow that. They ask you questions and, and you think about it. Um, and I think the thing that really turn me over into outreach completely is is I saw um, who was our spokesperson at the time was Fabiola Gianotti. When we turned on, uh, we had a, a cameras installed in the different control rooms and the, and, and uh, she spoke to this to explain, hey, we're turning on everything's going fine over at the Atlas experiments. And, and, and then I, I found out afterwards that she was reaching millions of people. And I said, that's really, really cool. And so when the resource coordinator came to me and said, uh, we got to give back this equipment. I said, no, you're not going to give back that equipment. We're keeping that equipment. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk to classrooms. And so I invented something that we call virtual visits now. And we now have it at all the different experiments. We do virtual visits. And we're in a control room or we're underground. This is sort of a view I took actually from a place where I talked to classrooms underground. And simply having that behind you <laughs> uh, poses questions. People ask lots of questions. And I got, it just gets to be more and more fun. The more I do it, the more fun I have. Um, what I try to do now all the time, I'm almost always bringing a young, usually female or minority student with me to talk because what's really missing, what Ripsy learned is how difficult it is to do science when you're a woman. Uh, also, if, if you, you know, you're, you're a minority, although everyone's a minority at CERN. Um, it's, it's, it's not simple. The, young women need role models. And so we're trying very, very hard to make sure. And everything we do, every time we shoot a video, every time I do anything, if there's any image, when I'm asked, I say, no, I've got a friend here. She can, she can do the, she can host the visit because we need to put that forward. Uh, it's particularly bad. In particle physics, we're something like 20%, a little over 20% women. It's, it's, it's outrageous. And we're people who, wax poetic about our international collaborations. Our collaborations have people from over a hundred different countries and their backgrounds. We reach out all across the globe, but we're not keeping women in our field. And that's, that's, that's a shame. It's a really bad thing. We all know the importance of having a variety of ideas, a variety of mindsets when you're trying to calculate your systematic uncertainty of a measurement and to eliminate half the people in the world is not a good idea.
So this is something that I like to champion now, I'm working on uh, hard as I can, um, but just getting reaching out to every single school we possibly can, uh, it, it just, it thrills me. And so I've stayed in it. And um, somehow my colleagues liked me doing it. They, they asked me to do, to, uh, to chair IPOG. I get to do that for a couple of terms. It's, it's a lot of fun um, to see how everybody does different methods for reaching out into classrooms. And so that's where I'm at. There's my, there's my condensed version of my life in particle physics and outreach. Okay, thank you very much for the condensed version. Um, now, uh, I would like to ask a, a follow-up follow question. Uh, Stephen, you speak uh, quite a bit about the, the importance of speaking uh, in, in physics. Uh, so uh, how, would you, how do you think uh, young physicists should approach this? And what, what do you think are the most important aspects of, for learning uh, speaking and communication? So not not every first of all don't don't feel that you have to be a speaker. Um, many people communicate well in different manners. Okay, uh, you should do it if you if you like it if you feel comfortable with it. But you should always give it a try. I think um, uh, the times when I first learned about it was when I completely failed. Um, I would say you know being invited by uh, a nephew to go speak in his junior high school something like that. Uh, thinking I gave a great talk. None of the kids understood a thing that I'd said. And then, you know, someone asked, you know, raised their hand and says, yeah, can, can you tell me why you said this, this whole thing, it costs $2 billion. Why should we do that and not just give the money to feed people in Africa? And that really hit the nail on the head. I, I was, of course, my answer was, was, was garbage. I don't even remember what I said. I was, I was you know, sweating and feeling terrible about myself and ready to, you know, just leave and go become a nurse somewhere or something. I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do. But um, uh, after you know, a lot of thought, you know, because I had to talk to someone, because I had to think about it and I had to think, well, how am I going to answer that next time? Because someone's going to ask me that question next time. And that's a really important question. Why should we be putting an investment in this instead of, you know, instead of giving food for people in Africa? It took me a long time. It took me about a year of thinking. And then my answer in the end now is, 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 is the good one. Actually, I'm quite happy with it because it's not making up anything. It's true. Um, we are building this thing is feeding people in Africa. Fundamental science gives us everything. You know, when we do fundamental science, we learn, you know, what can we do now? In the 1930s, we were scared there were going to be 1 billion people on the planet, and we had no idea how to feed them. Fundamental science taught us how to put nitrogen in the soil. Okay, we figured out how to make enough food in a sustainable manner. I mean, we can do that. Now. We can, when we get up to 13 billion, we can still do it sustainably if we're smart. We know how to make the food for them. We also figured out how to transport it. We helped come up with ideas of transportation as fundamental science came up with that. We also developed this crazy thing called the World Wide Web. And I hear that's catching on, I don't know. That allows us to know that people need food, right? This kid knew that people needed food in, in certain countries around the world uh, because they have the World Wide Web, they have information. So fundamental science has given it all of the possibilities. We have all the tools we need. The last thing that we need to do as scientists and as the public is to vote for people who will take care of that problem because we know there's that problem. So it's connected. What we do is important. It's essential. It's giving the tools our children will need to survive. And, and so this, you know, this having that, having given that talk, having had to speak to people, having had to write that down at some point, made me think it through as a, as a scientist and made me a better scientist, maybe understand why what I'm doing is important. So, uh, you know, this is, this is why I say it's good to speak. It doesn't necessarily have to be speaking right. If you're, if you feel more comfortable writing, that's a good thing, but try to communicate uh, what you're doing to someone who's not an expert and it will make you understand much better what you're doing and why.
Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, Terence, do you want to add anything to this question? Yeah, just um, practice, 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 uh, clarity, um, enunciation, um, pace is extremely important. And uh, as unfair as it sounds, uh, a lot of international science conferences are uh, orchestrated in English. So if you're not familiar with English, I encourage you to practice, practice, practice. Um, I, again, I, it's, 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 it's unfair, um, but that is the way that it, it kind of is currently. Maybe in 30 years, it'll be a different language. Maybe in 100 years, it'll be a, another language. But for now, it's English. And if you want to appropriately convey your ideas uh, verbally, you want to make sure that the audience understands you as best as they can. So uh, I would just encourage you to practice wherever you can, uh, however you can. Um, again, in those in those key areas: clarity, uh, pace, enunciation, um, and you know just being able to speak uh, effectively with with your audience. So, and unfortunately with that, I, I do have a meeting that's happening in three minutes. So I have to, actually it's happening now. I do have to sign off. Uh, I've put my email in the chat box. Uh, I really enjoyed speaking with you all. I really thank you for, for hosting me today. And it was really great meeting you, Herbsy and Steven and uh, Martin and Duarte. So I apologize, I have to sign off a little early, but uh, thank you for putting this together. Nice to meet you, Terrence. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. Take care. Thank you very much, Terence, for, nice for coming to here. Ryan. Thank you all. So, uh, where were we? Oh, uh, Herpsy, do you want to add anything to uh, to the question of uh, public speaking? Or uh, Actually, not public uh, speaking in general? Uh, what? Uh, and, and, um, do you want to add anything to, uh, to the speaking in physics and learning it? Um, actually, um, after what Stephen was mentioning, I do not want to say something because uh, he, he touched very important uh, aspects of the uh, problems which we have. Um, I will, I will just say that uh, try uh, because the physic, uh, physics is giving you uh, like experimental physics is giving you opportunity to try. And uh, after trying, you will have a result and absence of result is also a result. So in any case, you will have something. Okay, thank you. Now we have uh, a few questions from the audience, not much, but a few are here. So, um, this one is for Herpsy mm -hmm. uh, regarding your presentation. And uh, the question is, uh, can we apply for individual membership of the ES EPS? So is it, uh, is it possible to apply for individual uh, in, uh, membership? Oh, what does that mean, individual fellowship? Actually, everything is written in eps.org. They will find any instruction there. So just go there. And uh, if you will have any uh, problems uh, during the way of the applying, you can just contact. Okay, great. You, you probably asked even the, uh, answered even the second question, uh, which was how to apply for EPS. Uh, if um, they want to apply to becoming EPS member, that's something different. If you want to create a section or you, you want to create a platform for your students in your country, it's, it's uh, something different. Uh, I want to say that uh, EPS Young Minds project is um, uh, only for a student, uh, PhDs. And so you, you, it's another platform and EPS is another. So if you are a member of EPS, it's giving uh, you a lot of opportunities in participating in the EPS related conferences, meetings and so on. So it, uh, you, uh, all that information you will find in EPS web page. Uh, and uh, for the EPS Young Minds, you just sh should go to the EPS Young Minds page. Okay, thank you. Um, well, another question from for Hipsim. Don't worry, Stephen. There, there's one for you as well. So for Hipsim, uh, can we be both a member of EPS and IAPS? 
Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I actually, I can advise uh, be a member as many communities and societies as you can, because it's giving you a lot of opportunities. You are, you are making connection and you are making possibilities, not only for you, but also for your friends, for your uh, like um, collaborators. And so just go for that and do that. Okay, and uh, last one for Herpsim. Uh, what is the membership fee of Young Minds? Um, actually, this year we have uh, waived that, uh, but uh, in general it is 20 euro. Okay, thank you. And now uh, a question for Steven. Uh, what is the next big discovery at CERN? <laughs> uh Sure, if I knew that, I, mean, I, sh I should be on Wall Street. <laughs> uh, there, there's, there's so many things we're looking for. I can tell you what our next steps are and what we hope to find. And that's simply that um, we're, we're currently upgrading. This, this detector you see behind me, all the detectors are, are upgrading to be able to take data more quickly. Uh, because the next time we turn back on, which will be in about a year and a half, uh, then the LHC will be delivering uh, what we call a higher luminosity that's more collisions per second more big bang for the buck i like to say it's it's, it's you know we instead of 40 million per second we're going to go up even higher than that in the number of collisions uh that we have and so our data has to be able to, our data taking has to be able to handle that and then we might go a little bit higher in energy but we can't really go much higher we can go maybe from 13 to 14 tev but the discovery that we're really pushing for is is, is really rare phenomena and so that means you need many, many more collisions. And uh, this will last for several years. And then we're going to even do even larger upgrades uh, before we go to what's called high luminosity LHC, which is, you know, so we're going really up like a factor of 10 in the amount of collisions per second, which means really rare phenomena. Uh, the thing that's, that we've got a little bump of right now to give you an example is the Higgs um, boson decaying to muons. I would say, okay, big deal. What's the, <laughs> we already did that. You decayed to four muons. Now it's only two. The thing is that, well, it was proposed as the device, as the, the, the Higgs field was proposed as the reason that fundamental particles have mass. It's kind of a cool question because why would something with has no volume have a mass? Um, and that Higgs field, now we've seen it interacting with the particles in the third family, the more massive family. But now we're looking at it in the less massive family, the second, so muons and charms. That's a really cool stuff, even though it might not thrill you, but that's we're finding out that these guys 50 years beforehand were right in what the Higgs was supposed to do. Uh, by measuring that really precisely, we can try to get the answers to these really fundamental questions we still have. And those are simple, uh, very simple. We've had them since the beginning of time. Where do we come from? You know, so the question of of why is, you know, why and why do we even exist? Matter we have too much matter and there's no antimatter. Why didn't all the matter and the antimatter disappear at the beginning of time and there's just energy left over? We don't understand that. So there's an imbalance. So we're studying antimatter. There's a lot of other things besides the LHC where we're studying antimatter. Um, trying to understand our universe. You know what. You know, it, it's the, the vast majority of our universe is something we call dark energy. It is pulling us apart faster and faster. We have no idea why the universe is expanding at a faster and faster rate. We don't get that at all. That's like 60 something percent of the universe. We don't get uh, another huge part of the universe is dark matter. What's holding together galaxies and, and what's out there that we can sort of map because of the lensing of stars, but we have no clue what it is. That's something we really would like to think that these devices here will be able to measure. Something that, that's, that we really, you know, dark matter is something that's, that's really, you know, got us thinking. And so we're looking for that. And we hope that with the really uh, more collisions that we have per second, we'll be able to figure out dark matter. So I'm talking about, you know, we're missing 95% of the universe. <laughs> and we're trying to figure that out. There's a lot of other questions out there. Why is gravity so weak? And, and um, are there extra dimensions, et cetera? And I don't know which one's going to win. I really have no idea. If, if I really had to bet, I, I would say maybe we'll get a hint on dark matter. Maybe that's something beyond the standard model we'll get some sort of hint on. Uh, but I really 
I really don't know. We could go until the end of the LHC, another 20 years, and not have any real significant discovery like the Higgs boson, but to have mapped out a huge, huge area of physics that will make us smarter so that the next accelerator will be able to find a discovery. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you anyway. <laughs> so uh, we have another question from the audience, uh, this time for Hepsim. Uh, what are you currently working on or planning to work on in research? Uh, now I am working in cosmic ray division and investigating thunderstorms activity. And now we are uh, measuring uh, particles during thunderstorms in uh, these mountains. We have a high mountain station there. And uh, I can say that the first time in Armenia, we have measured radiation from thunderstorms and see how it's uh, going uh, during the all storm. And we can now uh, explore what's happening inside uh, and how we have lightning, why we have them and how they are originating. So uh, it's very important question for now because uh, we have a lot of hail storms. We have a lot of um, like uh, heavy rain, which is having uh, damages for agriculture. So um, the main uh, topics for now for studying is the studying of uh, electric electrical nature of thunder clouds. And I do really enjoy it. And uh, actually, I just want to say that I continue to work on this field because I find it, it's very important for my country. And I want to, uh, to do something and I want to change something. So when you will decide uh, in which field to do to go, just uh, uh, find for you the answer, how it's important for you and for society when you are living. Okay, thank you, Hepsi. So uh, there are no more questions from the audience. So um, I will ask one more question. And if there are no questions uh, from the audience, uh, I think we can we can end this session. So um, um, Terence mentioned. Uh, we will start with Stephen, for example. Uh, and Terence uh, Terence mentioned uh, the importance of networking in physics. So uh, I just wondered if you would like to add, add anything to that. Can I add to that? Coffee. Coffee is, is essential. <laughs> we, we spend a lot of time. This one sort of blends in with my detector there, doesn't it? Um, we spend a lot of time talking with our colleagues. I, I mean, there's many different fields of physics. And of course, you should go into the field that, that interests you the most. Um, I enjoy particle physics for many different reasons. Just the basic concepts blow my mind, but um, also the fact that I get to work in these huge international collaborations um, is fantastic. I get to meet really bright people from all over the globe. And, uh, and that's, there's no experience like that. I think you, you learn about different cultures, you, you learn about different ways of thinking I think that's that's just an extraordinarily valuable thing uh, to do, and so um, I think you know when you're pursuing your career, take all these things into mind. I think many many fields are that way now. You know, I think uh, most fields have strong international uh, connections, and uh, so so. But it, it is something to think about uh, when going into career. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because of that, I mean, I, I, I don't feel I have to, I mean, I'm a member of, of a variety of different societies and organizations, and I find that very valuable. Um, nowadays, what that means for me is I have to often fly to different places to sit on advisory boards or things like that. Um, and and that's, that's a lot of fun and, and very interesting because then I get to meet even more people from a variety of different uh, areas. So it is, it is useful. Connect to people. Uh, as, as Terrence said, he was right. Um, when we're looking for people, we're looking for young people to come work with us on different projects, when we're looking to hire, of course, if you know somebody and you've seen how well they worked, it makes a huge difference. If you've talked to them, if you've even just had a coffee with them and you've learned what kind of person that is, it's gonna influence you when you're making 
decisions. And so, yeah, meet lots of people, talk with lots of people. Uh, I know we're all shy and introverted because we're scientists, but <laughs> Terrence is right. <laughs> meet, meet different people, uh, network, find out what they're doing. You'll learn their points of view. Uh, you'll learn, you'll, you'll learn. So it's worthwhile. You started talking about you, Terrence, because you'd left, but now you're back. I suspected so. Yeah, my meeting ended, so here we, here we are. <laughs> Great to have you back, Terrence. <laughs> So, um, Herpsy, would you like to add anything to to the topic of networking and perhaps uh, some uh, any advice for networking? I think that uh, important in, in like uh, important findings and discoveries is happening when you are uh, when the scientists are gathering. Like um, sometimes you are focused on your research, on your topic, and when you are discussing with someone, there is going to be very interesting question about that. So you will start to think and maybe you will find something new. And uh, I think I, I, I do really like very much networking with the scientists when I'm in conferences uh, because it's opening new uh, doors for me. Uh, I'm finding new things which I do not know uh, living in my country and I, I can benefit from them not only for myself but for my group of research, for the students with whom I am working. For instance, there is uh, one example. Uh, now I had, uh, I was working with one of the master students and now I can, I could help her to go to continue her study abroad. So I'm so happy because when I was on, on her age, I do not have that opportunity. But now, uh, like community, commun uh, communicating with the other scientists, I find a way how to help her. And so, uh, and other stuff is that I, I was bringing the examples and I want to mention it again, uh, because of networking, I could uh, find for myself new research field and uh, working with the new Collaborate uh, new groups of uh, in different country by online by emailing and getting from them any questions and trying to answer them. We have published a paper together, which is a uh, like a main thing for the scientist. If you want to become scientist, you need to have a lot of papers. Um, so uh, I I uh, I just adore that and I uh, advise them not to be uh, to be shame. Uh, actually, I had a problem with my name. Nobody was remembering my name and nobody wants to pronounce it to uh, to communicate with me. And so uh, all the time I was uh, in, like trying to uh, have some kind of stories related with, with my name and to make them to remember me. And it was really hard way, but I found just to try make jokes and uh, it's uh, it sometimes it's helping. So be free because nobody is going to judge you. And uh, when you are presenting something, uh, think that uh, not uh, think that you are a student all the time and somebody is going to check what you are uh, saying. Just be free and uh, be uh, like more uh, comfortable with the idea that you are also a person who is going to teach, which is much more important. Okay, thank you very much. And now Terence is back. Welcome. So Terence, uh, we, we talked about uh, what you started, which was the importance of networking. So would you like to add anything to that or any advice for networking perhaps? Yeah, I think um, Ripsy and Steven touched on it, but uh, don't be afraid to, to, you know, reach out to people that you have no connection with. Um, you know, oftentimes students will ask me, well, I, I just don't know what to say. Um, well, <laughs> anytime I ask a student what their researching is, they will all of a sudden go from this very quiet individual to this very <laughs> talkative person. So uh, professionals in the field are the same way. If you don't know what to say, just ask them what they do in optics and photonics, and they will gladly go on a, you know, a, a five to 10 minute conversation about, um, you know, what it is they do. Uh, in the field. And that's a great just icebreaker. Um, and just don't be afraid to, I mean, to, to connect, really. It's, it's getting out of your comfort zone. And um, even for me, I, I love presenting. Uh, as a kid, I was in drama. I love theater. But it's always just that first step that's a little nerve wracking. But once you're actually in the midst of a conversation, it, it gets easier. 
And uh, I want to just say that the example for you is uh, that in, in the end, after this meeting, you can just keep in contact with us and try to, uh, if you had any question which you didn't arise because of uncomfortableness or something, you can just email us and ask whatever you want. Maybe it will be established new uh, thing for you and for your community. Okay, th thank you all very much. And uh, now uh, there are no more questions from the audience. So I think uh, we can <laughs> begin to conclude. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, I would like to ask uh, all of you uh, if you have uh, like anything you, you really uh, feel we left out. And if you have some nagging feeling that we really should, uh, that something should have been said, but it wasn't. So uh, please be brief, but if you have uh, that feeling, um you can comment on it now so hopefully um okay uh, so um i just want to say that uh, if you are student uh, remember that it's not all the time so you are going to finish soon and uh, start to think that uh, you are going to become a good specialist in your field in whenever you are and so just try uh, to train you to be free uh, not to uh, not to be shamed for any kind of in, in during the any kind of the meetings uh, and uh, as we said already try to make a connections because having connection over the world is always help, help helping you uh, i can bring several examples but i think you will find yourself as well so uh, it was a very nice uh, for a meeting and uh, thank you for invitation. And I hope that uh, we, uh, we help some, someone in the world to, to, to change something in his mind or her mind. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Steven, any concluding thoughts or uh, any nagging feeling we left something out? Oh, I'm sure we left a lot of things out, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> we're not, we're not going to cover everything. I, I think what Ripsy said was, was, was perfect, was right on the spot. Um, get out there, um, make mistakes and make them big because that's how you learn. Uh, so don't be, don't be afraid to say something that's stupid. You're, you're going to be surrounded by smart people. They're going to, they're going to tell you, you might feel bad at first, but then you'll know better the next time. And there's a lot of things that, that you have to learn all along the way at every age. I'm still always learning from my colleagues. I'm still making big mistakes and saying stupid things, but I, I try to learn from them. And so, so don't be afraid, get out there, meet the public, have fun with them, talk to them. Uh, don't be afraid also when you're talking to them and they ask you a question that you don't know, say, I don't know. Uh, they'll trust you better. <laughs> you're, you're a scientist, don't make it up. <laughs> the worst thing you can do is to make up something when you're talking to people and be wrong. So, um, you know, just, just go out there and have fun. Uh, there's a lot of fun stuff to do, especially in education and outreach. You're, you're going to have a great time. And for your careers, uh, pursue what you like. Uh, enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, change. You can change it anytime. Uh, and become, as Ripsy said, become an expert. That's, that's the best thing. If you really, in any particular area, you become, if you do a PhD especially, you will at some point in your life be the smartest person in the world at a specific topic. Enjoy that. It's a great, great feeling. That's, that's all I have to say. It's been a lot of big pleasure to be here talking with all of you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, Terence, any, any concluding thoughts of yours? Yeah, I would just say keep the conversation going. Um, you know, I never met Duarte um, and he reached out to me and I said, this is something that uh, I would love to be a part of. And I think it plays into that uh, conversation of just don't don't be afraid to, to take challenge or take on risks or uncertainties because you don't know the value um, of what you might receive by doing so. Uh, so I hope that you as listeners continue to take notes and, and reach out to people that can assist you with assisting other people. Uh, it's all about networking and, and connections. So, um, you know, thank you for taking the time to, to spend with us today. It's been, it's been a, a pleasure. Okay, thank you.
And so um, we came to the end. I would like to thank all the speakers for the wonderful conversations, presentations, and answers. It was a great pleasure meeting you. Um, I would also like to thank Duarte, who made all this possible. Um, and I would also like to uh, thank uh, all, the, all the people watching. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Martin. And thank you, Duarte. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you, Martin, you for, for moderating. Time.